thanks for that intro, Kopi. Uh, my name is Keith Adams. I was most recently at Slack, currently a little bit underemployed. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, a framework that we use to, to think about end to end quality uh, at Slack. And uh, a couple of caveats apply here. Um, we are, uh, first of all, we're going to be doing a little bit of math here. Part of the, of the goal of this framework is to be able to talk quantitatively about stuff that's sort of dominated by anecdotes and, uh, and feelings. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of math, but uh, don't be too intimidated. It's mostly high school math. We're going to be adding things, multiplying them, and dividing them. Um, it's also uh, a little bit of a disclaimer that I should present here is that these ideas are, are new. And while we applied them at Slack and in a few other companies I've advised, um, it hasn't been deeply field tested yet. It could be that this is wrong or not even wrong in some deep way. So please engage intellectually before uh, you know, betting your life on anything that you see here today. And I've kind of genericized the story here a little bit for the purposes of this slide because a lot of people can tell a similar story. Um, but the genesis of this framework was in 2016 when I joined Slack as uh, when I joined Slack as chief architect, we were in the middle of a perceived quality crisis. And so there are a bunch of things going really well. We'd achieved product market fit. We were growing really quickly. Um, usage of the product was skyrocketing. But anecdotally, we were seeing customers and users complain a lot more. And the things they were complaining about were that um, the client or the service was slow, that they were encountering bugs more often. Um, we ourselves were starting to, to have downtime, epi downtime episodes, right? Times where there were real liability challenges. Um, and while this didn't get to the point where it uh, impacted customers, there was a backlog of security issues as well that were concerning to us. And it was hard to tell uh, whether we were being responsible with, with that backlog or not. And lots of people can tell the story. Uh, I think this is sort of one of those problems that you graduate to at some point or another in your, uh, in your existence as a software business. And one of the things that makes the kind of work that we're talking about, this kind of maintenance work that, that can burn back those backlogs so difficult, is that you get almost no feedback from doing it. And it's really hard to tell whether what you're doing is working, whether what you're doing is actually having any impact on, on users' experiences. Um, and it's hard to tell whether you're doing better or worse than you were before. Um, to contrast this, if you're doing product-oriented work or if you're doing work that sort of is playing offense, making new features, making new products, you get a lot of immediate feedback, right? Even before launch, those things are actually fun to play with. Um, and, oh yeah, thanks for pointing out PMF as product market fit uh, in the chat. So even, even before launch, um, you get to, to tell that this new widget works really well and, and that users are going to love it. And then when you do launch it, it's also very noticeable. You get pretty rich feedback from users right away. Uh, if you have a, a online community that uh, interacts with your, your code base at all, they'll notice it, they'll tweet about it, they'll tell you that this is happening. Um, whereas even a heroic maintenance play, right, a, a maintenance play where you take 10% you know, out of the performance of something critical, for instance, might literally not even be noticed inside of the company. You might do that and just utter crickets. Um, so we need to somehow turn up the volume on these signals and, and produce some sort of quantitative view that, that we're having impact when we do this kind of work. Um, the framework that I introduced is called SPQR, which stands for Security, Performance, Quality, and Reliability. Uh, believe it or not, SPQR is very memorable for me because I was a Latin geek in high school. Um, if it isn't for you, it used to stand for Sonatus Populusque Romani, the Senate and the Roman people. Uh, they still put it on manhole covers in the city of Rome. Um, and SBQR is, uh, is going to, as we'll see, is going to be framed in terms of probability. But the goal here isn't to actually approximate any real world number per se, but to produce something that uh, unifies and, and, and quantifies these things that were stuck in the world of just subjective uh, nonsense and arguments. And one of the problems you run into almost right away here is that while some of these uh, maintenance activities have numbers associated with them, the, num the units on the numbers are always different. Um, so for example, when we measure performance, we do it with a stopwatch. Uh, we usually talk about performance in terms of latencies or if we're being sophisticated, a distribution of latencies, right? So we might say that the 99th percentile latency is 200 milliseconds for some endpoint. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you talk to people about uptime, a lot of times they'll use nines, uh, which are the negative log 10 of a probability that the site is up. Um, so a site that's up 99.99% .99 of the time is said to have four nines of uptime. 
Um, and it's pretty unclear if we'd like to improve reliability, we'd like to improve performance, which is going to matter more. Um, and how do I even tell whether I've made as big an impact on performance as I have on reliability and so forth. And to try and make this all work, I'm going to try to unify all of these things under uh, a notion of an unacceptable experience. And this is a term I made up, right? Don't use it while trying to sound intelligent to other people. Um, and unacceptable experience is actually a psychological event, uh, so we can't directly perceive it. And the psychological event we're describing here is the moment when a user realizes that they should consider other ways of solving their problem. So, for example, if I'm a Slack customer and I'm trying to send a message and it takes five seconds, that is long enough for me to actually have the thought, I should have just sent this over SMS. Um, if uh, that's an example of a performance unacceptable experience, there's other kinds of unacceptable experiences, um, data loss, uh, a bug, right? If you click the reticulate splines button and only the even splines reticulate, none of the odd ones do. Um, that's another moment where you might say, gosh, I wonder if there's some other way to get this job done. Now, we know that uh, our activity at maintaining our software influences these unacceptable experiences, even though we can't directly go out and measure them. Um, so those kinds of experiences that come from bugs, that come from, uh, from hangs, that come from uh, times where the service is down when, when people are trying to use it, we know that those are causing some rate of unacceptable experience out there, even though we can't directly instrument users to see the experiences. So, um, a key observation here and that motivates the whole rest of the framework is that there's really only one way for an experience to be acceptable, which is where nothing unacceptable happens. There's lots and lots of ways for your interaction with the service to go wrong. There's really only one way for it to go right. Um, so imagine for the sake of discussion here, and, and there's a little bit of suspension disbelief involved at this stage, um, but suppose that I literally had a list of all the things that can go wrong in my system, all the things that users might care about that can, can uh, hinder their progress. How do you build that list, et cetera? We don't know yet. Just, just hold that thought for a second. Let's pretend we have the list. We're going to notate all those events that can go wrong as E sub I. And we've got another miracle. Not only do we have that list, we've got a decent estimate of the probability that these happen. We've got a decent estimate of the frequency with which all of these events happen. So your odds of having a good experience is going to be your odds of avoiding all those bad experiences. And I'm writing this here as it is the product over all of those, uh, over all those problems of the probability of not happening. Um, this is, if the, your eyes are glazing over a little bit with the big pie and everything, um, there is a little bit of a numeric intuition that this captures about reality that I'd like to share here before pressing on which is imagine that we start with a nearly perfect system that just has one little bug in it. And that one little bug hits a thousandth of the time. So we have a system that 99.9% you know, .9 of the time works just fine. It's perfectly possible and reasonable for us to say, this is an, indu an industrially useful system, let's ship it. Um, and over time, more of those difficult to perceive on their own bugs creep in. Um, if you have 10 of those different problems, uh, you're already down to two nines, right? You're down to 99%. If you have 100, you're at 90%. And things that only work 90% of the time essentially don't work. People are going to be thinking about how to solve their problem so frequently um, that they're not going to use your system. And the, the cruelty of multiplication here kind of captures the death of a thousand cuts feeling of being in one of these quality crises. Um, you have no you have this sort of sea of bugs, no one of which accounts for all of the problems that you have, and they somehow seem to be more than just a rising tide. Every bug you add isn't just making things a little bit worse, it's making things worse in proportion to the problems you already have. Um, and this is, until you've sort of been in this situation, it's hard to, uh, to really appreciate how devastating this is and how scary it is. So revisiting those assumptions that I asked you to suspend for a second back there, um, there are kind of two big assumptions. First is that we can make a list of all the problems, and the second was that we can actually tell how often the different problems are happening. Um, 
spoiler alert, I don't actually have a way to perfectly do this, but I have ways to do this better than chance and, and ways that uh, partly come out of processes that probably already exist in your engineering department. Um, however, you have to use different processes for enumerating and estimating for the different sorts of, of problems that can arise. So you remember SP, Q, and R before? They all correspond to different regimes of how you find the problems and how you estimate their probability. Uh, and I'm gonna take the easiest one first, in some ways, or the ones where the, with the most convincing results first, which is reliability. So uh, reliability here is strictly trying to eliminate failures, right? So overloads, misconfiguring DNS, um, any other kind of situation where uh, the system's not behaving as designed for whether for load reasons or for, um, for configuration reasons. So it's distinct from say bugs, right? It's distinct from I clicked a button, it doesn't do what I wanted it to do. And this is beyond the scope of this talk, but if you've not heard the good news about observability and you're not busily instrumenting your code base, very little of this is gonna be directly applicable until you get on board the observability bandwagon. Um, the, uh, and, and none of this is, there's lots of tools and vendors and things uh, that will enable you to ask questions of your telemetry, um, but they can't tell you what questions to ask. This talk is about what question you wanna ask of your telemetry. Um, but table stakes here is I'm instrumenting requests, I'm instrumenting clients, I'm instrumenting user actions. So for those things that actually enter your observability pipeline, you have a very straightforward way of, of getting a very nice real-time readout of reliability, which is how often do I succeed? So success is for the, the user interactions that are critical divided by the total number of interactions. There's another little term in here that, uh, that or factor really that I should uh, admit to, which is uptime. So uh, whatever your observability pipeline is, itself fails sometimes. Sometimes your whole site fails and that uh, causes black periods in your observability pipeline. So hopefully that's not happening very often. Most days you, you just get a 1.0 for this. But if you had a day where you had an hour you know, site-wide outage or something, you do have to multiply this whole thing by uptime. Um, so uptime bounds above your liability, which makes sense. So next on the hit list here is performance. And performance, again, we're gonna rely very heavily on, on this expectation that you've got a reasonable observability pipeline operating. Um, so the same way that you were instrumenting you know, all of the, the user interactions that you consider critical, um, you should also be bounding their start and their end. And you should have some timestamp, hopefully taken from the same clock, uh, that measures how long that took. Uh, an example of something that, that Slack would have considered critical for performance uh, is message send latency, right? You want to make it so that when I hit send, you see the message quickly. When you send me a message back, I see it quickly and so on. Um, so again, this is gonna come straight out of your observability pipeline. There is one wrinkle with performance here though, right? Which is uh, normally performance doesn't give you success or failure. Performance just gives you some sort of latency. It took some amount of time. So for performance, we, we need to, to do one other trick here to turn this into something that we can measure with probability, which is to make up some threshold beyond which things are no longer acceptable. Um, so if we uh, say, for instance, a reasonable message send latency is five seconds, we'd just be counting the ones that were shorter than five seconds as successes and dividing them by the total. Um, you might be saying, well, five seconds, that sounds pretty arbitrary. What if I have a disagreement about this? What if somebody thinks it's really three seconds? Um, it turns out in practice, these numbers aren't super sensitive to setting this threshold as long as you make a reasonable effort to set it. Um, so for example, uh, 10 milliseconds is way too aggressive for a lot of user interactions. You can't perceive 10 milliseconds. But the difference between three seconds and five seconds doesn't end up affecting this number very much because in practice, there's things that are fast enough and things that where something went wrong. And those things where something went wrong, it's really very, very sensitive to whether you chose to say four seconds or five seconds was the threshold. Um, and if it does prove to be in practice, that suggests that, um, that you might have the threshold set too aggressively. All right, now onto the parts where um, we're 
massive objections are possible. So quality, and in the SPQR sense of quality here, we're talking narrowly about basically bugs, misbehavior, um, things where there are the bad kinds of, uh, where we have the bad kinds of surprises for users. Now, um, there's a little bit of a sea change here with quality because telemetry is not gonna save you. You're not gonna instrument all the bugs in your code. Because for the most part, you don't know about where the bugs are. It's gonna be very rare that you even, even with a very high impact bug, it's gonna be rare that you instrument its occurrence because it's probably cheaper and more, uh, more sane to just fix the darned bug. So the answer here is not just to fall back on your observ observability pipelines. So here we are stuck using uh, estimates that are driven by something we already have lying around, right? So we have to make these decisions anyway, right? We have to decide whether uh, releases are shippable, whether features are ready to show to customers and so on. And we do that currently with a bug database. Um, it's just that we do it without sort of attempting to quantify it or attempting to map it onto any kind of actual user experience. And so I'm gonna make a claim here, which uh, is, it has been controversial in some discussions, but I think has held up okay so far, that the severity field of your bug database is interpretable as probability of occurrence, maybe times severity, right? So think about that for a second. When I'm saying that this bug is a minor bug, I'm essentially saying that it has a very, very, very low probability of driving a user off of our product. And when I'm saying that a bug is a high severity bug, I'm saying that it has an unacceptably high probability of driving a user off of the product. And so, when building this SPQR process, uh, at the time, uh, Slack's bug database was quantized into five levels of severity. And we basically, I basically went through and said decimal order is magnitude. Like, the lowest level of severity has a one in a million chance of driving somebody from this product. The highest level of severity has a 1% chance of driving somebody off of this product. Um, there's another really important uh, use of, of uh, signal that you wanna drive in here too, which is actually customer tickets. So if you have a customer support organization, they have some real time insight into the problems customers are actually hitting. You massively undersample, right? Very few unacceptable experiences turn into somebody's customer ticket. Um, so you can swag what percentage of, of people actually pick up the phone when something goes this badly wrong but something like a thousand to one seems to, to track reality decently well. Um, a quick aside here about quality and a, and a metric that doesn't work um, or that can't be made to work in this framework anyway. You might have a lot of code quality tools, tools that um, statically analyze your code base and say, oh, I found this many problems of this kind and that many problems of that kind. Those are lovely tools, you should keep using them and you should keep using them to drive your code quality efforts, but they're not behavioral. They can't see what users are doing. So you could have a single bug in your 10 million line code base that every user exercises 10 times a second that is a critical bug, or that single bug could be in dead code that's impossible to reach for, from the live site. Um, there's no way to know from just analyzing things offline. You need the behavior of humans to drive it. So there's this big messy thing uh, that, that describes how quality is computed. Um, it's a blended average of the customer ticket signal and the bug database signal. Um, the little, the big pie expression there is just saying multiply up all the probabilities of the bugs. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, th this one almost might be easier to read the SQL query because you just sum up the logs of them. Um, it's easier to understand. Um, so there's a couple magic numbers in here. One is how you want to weight the averages. Um, that's literally an aesthetic choice. Another is how, how big K is, right? How much do you undersample if you just pay attention to customer complaints because it's going to be rare for customers to actually complain. Um, again, the important part here is not that we have a perfect estimate of unacceptable experiences, but that we have a directionally correct estimate, right? We're going to use this to tell that the things we're doing are working. Um, so whether we say it's 99% and reality is 99.9%, that's okay as long as it's directionally tracking. 
And finally, security, which is kind of the, the messiest of all of these and the, and the one that I have the least confidence in. Um, one of the big problems with security is that incidents are always too late. Right? You don't want to wait for, for the things that uh, humans actually are running into. And I've been a little bit uh, satisfied when trying to talk to, to InfoSec colleagues about this, that apparently usable security metrics are still kind of a research topic. So this is basically just the bug database approach, uh, but applied to bugs that are in the security category. You've got some backlog of known issues, however you, you've built them up, you've got them rated by severity, um, and we're just gonna use the approach of treating them as independent events and saying, okay, we're, you know, the odds of you hitting all this is just your odds of making it through all, uh, all of these independent events. This is, um, you know, this is something that sort of tracks the right direction in the same sense that burning down your bug database tracks the right direction. Um, but I have the least confidence in this one. There's also a, a kind of reality, which is that security events for, for especially enterprise companies are often existential, right? It's important to never have a really disastrous security event um, in a way that's less true of never having downtime or never having a performance problem. Um, and so you want to be really careful with this factor, right? You could have security saying, hey, it's 99.9%. Um, but if your company lives a thousand days, it might not be acceptable to have a, a single security event in those thousand days. And so the big health metric, um, the thing that, that measures this all into end, treats those four categories as independent things. And so it just multiplies them together. You say, our overall health, our odds of a user having an, a good interaction with the site, RS times P times Q times R, security, performance, quality, reliability. Um, independence here is a little bit of a, of a modeling assumption and uh, you could definitely pick, pick nits with it. There certainly are interactions between performance and reliability and quality and everything else. Um, it just seems that this assumption of independence is the uh, is the most, you know, involved the least assumptions about the underlying structure of reality, and so we went with it. Um, I implemented this at Slack on top of uh, our data warehouse, actually, so I didn't use any of the fancy uh, kind of SaaS um, observability pipelines or anything. Um, both of our client-side and server-side telemetry ultimately ended up in our data warehouse, which was Parquet Files and S3. Uh, and we had an in, an in a homegrown dashboarding tool that let us run Presto queries against that. Um, and I built little implementations of all these formulas in Presto and uh, built a pipeline that would digest yesterday's results and produce a data point each day. And a very early trail of this uh, looked a little bit like this. And Taking a look at this is actually kind of a nice way to, uh, to develop a slightly better intuition for how these things are gonna to behave too. So uh, we don't have a legend in here, um, but quality is green, performance is blue, um, both, uh, excuse me, both security and uh, reliability were, um, I guess, purple and yellow, but they're the ones that are pegged really, really close to one there. The, this was a period where we didn't have any outages. And one of the things this is telling us is, first of all, performance is volatile, right? Performance wiggles a lot. There's, some, there's meaningful day-to-day -day variation in performance. Um, digging into this, it turned out this was partly because of our deploy practices. Um, different story to tell by a different team. Um, it's also telling us that performance is driving more of the bad experiences than these other causes. And I think in, in retrospect, this was true at the time. The overall health metric is the orange line at the bottom. Um, it is below all of the other lines because, again, multiplication is cruel. Multiplication of, of these independent things means that your user perceived experience is going to be less than the minimum of all of these things. It's also being driven by performance at this time. The volatility in the end to end uh, experience basically perfectly matches the volatility in performance, um, which I think was a reasonable signal. And so there's obviously a ton of assumptions going into this, right? There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that could be off by an order of magnitude or two in any direction. But implementing this and having it be something that we could talk about um, did improve the discussions internally about these kinds of, uh, of maintenance issues. Um, for instance, over a long term, you can ask the question, were we getting better or worse? Um, if we made a major push in performance or made a major push in reliability, 
did you actually see that happen? And, and did you see some behavioral signal that suggested that users are actually harvesting this fruit? If I was talking to a senior uh, IC, like uh, one of the principal engineers at Slack who just was, was expending a lot of energy on performance, they might not be spending that energy on the highest impact places and having this trace of, okay, here are the endpoints that are violating their SLA, help direct their effort at things that were actually what users were experiencing. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, this is still, uh, these ideas are new and the presentation of these ideas is obviously still being refined. Um, I, I again would like to sort of stick a disclaimer in here that uh, I suggest you kind of engage intellectually with this before applying it blindly. Um, but I'm really excited about the possibility of turning uh, something that was entirely in the realm of people's feelings and interpreting the volume of tweets on Twitter and so forth um, into something that you have feedback on a daily basis um, where you can see the results of your work. And I think it has the potential to improve uh, not just our discussions, but also some of our decision making in these areas. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and I guess uh, we'll open up to questions with the time that remains. Thanks so much, Keith. I uh, really appreciated hearing all of that. It was extremely insightful. And we actually have a lot of questions from the audience as well. So one of the first questions that we have here um, is what are some tools or apps that you use to kind of track some of the things you've talked about today? Yeah, the, uh, this is one of those things where I would do it differently if I were doing it today. So at the time that uh, I was, we were doing this at Slack, there wasn't a big rich ecosystem out there of vendors that, that cater to this. Um, Honeycomb is wonderful. I'm, I'm not conflicted in saying that. Uh, they're, uh, I think they make a great tool, um, but there's a big ecosystem out there. So there's Lightstep and Datadog and Splunk and uh, doing it yourself on top of your data warehouse, uh, the way that we had to at Slack and so on. And different things are gonna make sense for different folks. Um, but if you're looking for some initial things to evaluate, uh, I think sort of Honeycomb, Datadog, Redshift, a couple other things, uh, it's gonna probably matter what you're set up on already too, uh, what's easiest for you to try. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and kind of just out of curiosity, how long have you been using some of these apps or, or tools or, or these things that just kind of change as they go? Yeah, uh, well, so before I was at Slack, I was at Facebook for seven years uh, and I was there kind of for the genesis of Scuba, which is uh, one of the systems that was pretty influential about this kind of thing. Um, so I've been using sort of a cousin of this probably since 2011 or so. Um, and um, it's one of the things that's tricky about these things is that um, they enable you to ask lots of questions. And so the, the marketing of these things is all, you know, hey, here are all these amazing questions you're going to be able to answer. Um, but a lot of questions are, are silly, especially with numbers. Like it's very easy to kind of accidentally make a little mistake that answers something very different from what you were trying to ask. Um, so SPQR is an example of like a, a, a relatively well-formed question that you can ask once you have this pile of data sitting there. Absolutely. Well, we have another question here from Yidner, uh, which is how much investment does the organization do on the observability to be able to calculate the metrics that you mentioned today? Yeah. So at this time uh, in Slack's history, we'd already doubled down on observability a lot. We'd already made uh, a, big, a big investment in sort of noticing that being able to debug the site in real time, being able to understand user experience in real time was well worth the expense. Um, so SPQR was, was free in the sense that, it, uh, that the observability metrics were already there. Um, but to give you some sense of, of the, the scale of investment there, the observability of stuff that backed up observability, um, including things like Grafana and, and sort of real-time monitoring of the site, were a very significant part of the infrastructure spend. Um, there's, uh, you know, we put a lot of hardware and a lot of effort into making the system observable. Um, and that makes sense because it's how you rescue things when things go wrong. It's kind of your last line of defense. Um, so if you're, um, if you're doing this on top of a conventional observability stack, it's sort of for free. I think in reality, a lot of people coming from sort of early post, you know, product market fit into, okay, we've got a hit on our hands, we need to actually fix bugs in it, we need to be able to scale it up and so on. Um, the observability pill, this is only one of the reasons that would motivate your, your effort to, to swallow the observability pill. But I'm taking it as a given that you're going to. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Well, we have another question here from Aiden, kind of related to what you were speaking about, and you kind of touched on that, is in practice, um, how does your organization use these metrics, and were they treated as kind of reliable, uh, guiding north, kind of, kind of guiding a north star for what to focus on as an engineering organization? So. Right. So I think like all healthy engineering organizations, Slack has a, an endemic skepticism to simple metrics that aggregate lots of information into very few numbers. Um, that's good. Um, I actually don't want people that have to write computer code for a living to um, entirely define their existence by sort of one number that moves. Um, the, uh, my kind of immediate reason for inventing this was uh, more for internal communication with other stakeholders outside of engineering. So for example, product people, you know, including founders, um, often as engineering teams grow, it seems like more and more energy goes into this stuff that they can't see and can't touch instead of sort of executing their beautiful visions for the, the feature roadmap, right? Um, so partly this was useful to communicate like, hey, we have this burning fire over here. Let's have, you know, can we have a quarter or two to actually do something about it? And then a quarter or two later say, yeah, look, we did something about it. We used to be down here, now we're up here. Um, so it was sort of useful at that, you know, rolled up kind of organization departmental level that way. I think internally to, to engineering, it was more useful in terms of project selection, in terms of trying to understand like what things would actually make an impact to make faster, what bugs actually need to be fixed, what classes of bugs would be important to eliminate entirely if you're, you know, looking for a, a, a big engineering project, for instance. Um, but I think North Star would be entirely too strong, right? This would be part of sort of a panoply of other kind of indicators that you'd use for for monitoring the performance of the whole organization. Absolutely. So we have another question here from Sumita. Um, or sorry, yeah, Sumita asks, um, how do we ensure accountability and ownership of the SPQR, um, SPQR in a microservices world? So rolling up to the global overall health of the product. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question, and I don't have a perfect answer to it. It's partly an organizational question. Um, the actual like, software pipeline for this, I just personally owned at Slack. Like, I just, you know, did it. And it was honestly, there were times where it kind of ramped up to being close to my full-time job. Um, so it would be great to have a, a full answer to this. Um, like all real software systems, Slack isn't a perfect microservices story. Like, when people first are trying to make something useful, they build a monolith. You're wasting your time building microservices if you don't have something valuable yet. So um, there are pieces of that monolith that have been broken out into services, but pieces that haven't. And uh, that's almost universal. I, I don't know of any place uh, that's happy about having gone all the way to the microservices in the sense of like there is no monolith anymore. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about this is that this is a little bit agnostic to implementation details of like how your backend is, is structured if you do if you do it end to end, right? So if your notion of quality is in terms of things that users would recognize, right? Is in terms of a user doing a unit of work with your product, right? So a, a for a Slack customer, sending a message, reading a channel, marking it red. Um, then it doesn't matter whether it's a bunch of microservices on the back end or a monolith, right? Your your transition microservices might enable you to say, ha, breaking out this service made uh, made end to end user reliability a nine higher and it made our performance 10% better. Um, so it might help you understand the impact of the changes you're making. Um, but this end-to-end -end ownership of this as, as a global thing does sort of stand outside of the organizational abstraction of microservices. I think that's intentional. Yeah. Okay. We have another question kind of related to SPQR from Daniel Naves. Um, he says, where can we find more material about SPQR uh, to learn more about his uh, novelty topic and how to have better decisions? Great question, Daniel. Uh, this is its public debut. So uh, this is the first time I've talked about this in a sort of generally accessible way. Um, I have a blog post on, on deck, but it is uh, not ready for publication yet. But I'm glad to hear that there's at least enough interest to support uh, finishing it. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd love to see that very soon. Um, we have another question is, have you ever seen this practiced in other organizations? It's from um, Patrick Bollinger. If so, how is it perceived when it was adopted? Um, yeah, that, that's sort of one of the great caveats I should say here. Uh, humbly, right, Slack's the only place where this made it into like OKRs, right, is the only place where this made it into sort of the official uh, infrastructure of running the organization that I know of. 
Um, and uh, while I've kind of talked about this at some advisee companies and somebody somewhere might have written a Presto query or two, I don't know of a place that's adopted it as kind of one of the dashboard lights for, for all of engineering uh, other than Slack. Um, and cool. while I believe it was helpful at Slack, I also want to be clear, this is really, really far from uh, you know, a panacea, right? The, the thing that actually made performance and reliability better over that period was a ton of individual efforts. Um, I think it helped guide some of those efforts and helped us choose to do this instead of that in some cases. Um, but this is a very narrow slice of, of whatever we were doing that was working well. Yeah, absolutely. We have another question from, um, uh, it says right there, do you have any recipe for incorporation of technical uh, debt into this metric? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting one. In technical debt, I think of as, um, as fitting into kind of the category I touched on briefly with quality, which is um, people often have um, some kind of pipeline or for evaluating badness in the code base, right? And that might be like some cyclomatic complexity thing or some static analysis thing, or, um, you know, it might be behavioral. You might be detecting functions that change quickly or that have lots of authors, stuff like that. The problem with trying to directly apply that here is just that you haven't closed the loop with what users actually do and actually care about. Um, and I don't mean to say that there's sort of no way to, to tell uh, that, like obviously technical debt feeds into this, right? Obviously technical debt makes it harder to do the changes to performance and reliability, especially that you'd like to make. Um, but the way that you know that your technical debt clearing efforts are working uh, is gonna be different, I think. I think you'd want that to be a metric that's focused on, on the code artifact um, and perhaps its execution in, in production. Um, ultimately, it should roll up here, um, but it's a very indirect way to tell. It's not a very uh, fruitful source of feedback for somebody sitting there trying to refactor 10,000 lines of code. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Keith, for sharing that with us. Uh, that kind of wraps things up here for our Q&A session and hearing from Keith. I want to thank, thank him again for coming to join us. Uh -huh.